Brooks Calvert Robinson went to bed Monday night and never woke up. He died at the age of 86, and ever since his death, we have heard story after story of how he touched our lives, how he became part of the family. And for us here in Baltimore, we love this man like we love Johnny Yu and Wes Unseld, and now we are mourning the loss of one of the greatest third basemen to ever play the game of baseball. But the man who we ran into in the grocery store, we ran into banquets, fundraisers, schools, and he always had time for us. And now we're taking the time to remember the great life of number five, Brooks Robinson. Baltimore and professional baseball go way back together, well into the last century, 1872, I guess, to put a date on it. But many of us date our history from 1954, 30 years ago when the Orioles returned to the major leagues. If you're old enough to remember those early years, you know that lightning didn't strike suddenly back in the 50s, but the foundation was being laid back then for lots of golden moments to come. 1966 was a 24 carat year, the year of Frank and Brooks and a kitty pitching core, and the year of a World Series against the Dodgers that could not have been sweeter. When he stepped onto the mound to pitch for the Orioles in the second game of that series, Jim Palmer was nine days short of his 21st birthday. Nine innings later, Palmer went into the record book as the youngest pitcher ever to throw a shutout in a World Series. And two games later, the Dodgers had been erased in four straight. It took five games to win the second world championship in 1970. Five games and Brooks Robinson. Offensively, Brooks had the game winner in two of the four games the Orioles needed. The first one in game one, one of his two series homers that year. But it was on defense that he took charge of the series and reduced the Cincinnati Reds to a frustrated red machine. Four more division titles and two more series appearances in the 70s before it turned solid gold again in 1983. The Three Stooges and their friends spotted the Phillies a game and then came back to win four straight. Rick Dempsey turned out to be the greatest stooge of the three, the series' most valuable player, as the Birds won their third world championship in less than two decades. Let's have a little more fun with the Orioles' high spots we passed over so lightly a moment ago, and let's bring in some help. A couple of gentlemen who remember those highlights so well. Brooks Robinson, the Orioles' Hall of Fame third baseman and Channel 2's baseball analyst, and Orioles Vice President Jack Dunn, the three, who has been associated with Orioles baseball. I'll tell you how long, as long as he can remember. <laughs> Jack, let's go back to uh, 1954. T tell us about what it meant to well, the Jack, city. Well, Jack, actually, state. the major leagues were looking for new sites. Bill Veck, who was running into some financial difficulties in St. Louis, decided in the spring of 1953, actually in March, to move the Orioles here for the 1953 season. He had made all the financial arrangements, and then he went to a meeting in Tampa where the American League was sitting to approve the transfer. Because of Bill's problems with some of the owners, his request was turned down. The Browns went back to St. Louis, and then following year, the following winter, 1953-54 winter, Clarence Miles got together a group of prominent Baltimoreans who successfully purchased the Browns from Vilvec moved here and the rest is history. Incidentally, looking back on that 1970 series, I have never seen any athlete so completely dominate a World Series as Brooks did in that year, and I'm proud to be sitting here next to him. And I'm including Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and anybody else you could mention. It was his World Series. We'll get a chance to see some of that dominance in that series in a little bit because we're going to get back. Brooks, uh, I'm just thinking this, uh, this threesome here of these 30 years of history of the <laughs> Orioles, uh, you're the youngster in this group. You've only been here for 29 of those 30 years. Jack and I have been here for all 30 of them, and then some. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, you know, it couldn't have worked out any better for me, Jack. Uh, I signed right out of high school in 1955, came to Baltimore here for a week, then I went to York, Pennsylvania. But uh, I got a chance to see the bad times and the good times, and uh, 29 years that uh, I've been following Oreo baseball, almost as long as you and Jack Dunn. <laughs> We, we teased our viewers with that very short little piece of uh, pictures that we showed earlier on uh, uh, about the, some of those great moments in the World Series that the Orioles have won over the years. How about all three of us just going back now with a little more detail and uh, enjoying some of those big years together. And we'll go back and start with 1966. And Brooks, uh, 
1966 and what happened in this World Series surprise you and the other guys on this team as much as it did a lot of us? Well, I think so. You know, we played in, uh, I had a chance to play in four World Series, Jack. The two we were supposed to win, we lost. The two we were supposed to lose, we won. But this was, uh, uh, we were very much uh, the underdogs in this particular series, and that was Frank Robinson who... There uh, you are. Well, I hit it even further than Frank this time, which surprised me. We both hit it off a pretty good pitcher, Don Drysdale. But Frank won the Triple Crown that year, and we got off to a big start. That was pretty much the... Uh, what the, the whole series in a nutshell those two home runs because it kind of set the stage what was to happen the rest of the series uh, and we, we did not have uh, any big winners that year uh, pitching wise I think Bunker won 15 games might have been the most uh, here you see McNally uh, I think that was the fever hit yeah, that ball yeah, and uh, that's all the way out of home there. run things got a little tough for Dave uh, before this game was over and uh, He's going to be out of there, and a fellow named Mo Drabowski, the well, old clown, is going to come in here. Yes, you're right, and Drabo does. He comes in, and he was not, I don't know when I've ever seen him throw any better, but he threw it right by just about every Los Angeles Dodger that he faced. He was a clown everywhere but on the mound. Uh, when exactly he got true. out there, that stayed behind. I ask the six of the Dodgers that he found in a <laughs> row whether he was a clown or not, and they'll, they'll tell you there goes one after another of them. Incidentally, all World Series are great, but I think the first one has to be the biggest thrill at the time anyway. Uh, I, of course, it wouldn't be for Brooks after the performance he had in 70, but the first one is really something special. I think so. I, I tell people, uh, of course, uh, Frank was the MVP of that series, but I still think that the first one is the one you remember the most. I think that's absolutely true. Here we are in the second game of that series, and well, let's remember Paul Blair. Well, well, that's Jack, right. I, I remember that we were out in California in our hotel, and I could absolutely could not sleep. I was so keyed up and so excited, so I thought I'd be crazy. At 4 o'clock in the morning, I got up went down in the lobby and there were four other Orioles sitting down there who had the same problem. Well, you, you never know it when they got into the into the ball games. Uh, here's a guy who may have lost some sleep. Uh, Mr. Davis had himself a few problems in that one inning. What were three errors in one inning, I guess? That's right. They made six errors that day when Koufax pitched and uh, we were able to, to win. That's Aparicio uh, driving the ball down the left field line. Yeah, Hall of Famer to be, huh? You bet. Uh, absolutely, and that's that's good news too. Three to nothing in that second game uh, at that point, and there's still more good stuff to come. That turns into a triple, and number 20 goes charging in there. Another Hall of Famer. Isn't it amazing? You, you look at this club, and it's uh, already produced two, uh, two full-time guys who are identified with this town as Hall of Famers, and others who have played here. Who would here, have made the Hall uh, of Fame in any era. Uh, and, uh, and other guys who have played here for part of their careers who are now Hall of Famers as well. George Kell that you went in with last year. Brooks, yes. Uh, My well, first opening day back in 1957. George played first, and I played third. So uh, you have a lot of them. That's Aparicio taking a, a pop fly there. And that might have been it, or close that, to that, it. That was that it, was, that was that it in Los Angeles. Then we yeah, came it was back in Los here Angeles. And, uh, then you came back here, and they put up that sign I can remember on 33rd Street that said, "Would you believe?" Four <laughs> straight. <laughs> and uh, my answer to it the first day I drove by was, "No, I don't think so." <laughs> I changed my mind before it was all over. Wally Bunker was uh, was on the mound there, and he got a couple, and then. This turns out to be the ball game, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Paul hit one as far as he's ever going to hit it in the left center field stands, and that was uh, the name of the game that day. The Orioles won, uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers nothing. Probably I'll never forget him in the locker room after the game. He was there sitting in front of his locker saying, it was me, it was me, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, uh, you know, the funny thing about it, we were in an old-timers game the other day, and Claude Osteen, who threw up the home run, was there, and, and Paul was still talking about it. <laughs> he, won't, he won't let Osteen forget it. Absolutely. Uh, I don't blame him one bit, do you? <laughs> no, I, I don't. Would, I wouldn't let him forget it either. And that's a pretty good target to throw to right there, Bull <laughs> Powell. He never got a lot of recognition, Jack, I guess because you had guys like Belanger and Davey Johnson and Aparicio and myself, but Boog was a terrific fielder to go along with his offense. And a, and a great target to throw to. Oh, from, boy. Uh, Boog was on those good tough on a players. thrown ball as any first baseman I've ever yeah. seen. I, I think that's an absolutely true statement. The last game was sort of like the third one. Uh, you got one home run that was all there was to it. Well, Frank and Drysdale, uh, Frank Robinson and Drysdale have uh, had had a, a battle going ever since Frank was in the National League, and I bet you Drysdale's probably hit him 10 or 15 times, you know, because Frank hang, hangs over the plate, and uh, Frank got the best of him in this particular series because he won the the last game uh, one to nothing on a home run, and you see Small Blair a make, little happy. <laughs> he sure is. Four straight that year. I'll he squeezed you, that was it. Absolutely magnificent. Hey, we are up to 1970 now. 
and uh, there you are. Well, uh, this, these highlights are really a little boring when you come right down to it. There are only two guys in them. <laughs> I, I tell people I played almost 23 years professionally. I never had five games in a row like I had in this particular series. You can play uh, uh, 160 games a year and uh, never have a chance, you know, two weeks in a row and never have a chance to make a good Nobody play. Nobody else and ever the, had the, it either. The thing people forget is the first ball I handled in this World Series, I made an error. I made a high <laughs> throw to Boog Powell. And you know, if you throw high to him, you made a bad throw. But after that, everything turned around. <laughs> we don't remember with, those things. Uh, <laughs> tell you. Elrod, that's a, never hit a ball down the left field line as long as I can remember. And here he hits a bases loaded triple down the left field line. That put us uh, back in the ball game. We were we outmatched them a little pitching wise in this World Series. Uh, they had some guys that were hurt, and they, we knew they were going to score some runs. You used to see bench. That's about as hard yeah. as you. I couldn't get out of the way of that one. All, ben all bench could, could see was you, and uh, then you come up here with a bases loaded double. Uh, it just goes on and on. And in case uh, Johnny Bench didn't remember the last time, we're going to see you get him a couple of more times before this is all well, over. When the series started, I felt like I was going to get a lot of work because uh, they had they had some guys like Bench and uh, Perez, and uh, they just they think about one thing. That's hitting the ball as hard as they can somewhere. And when we had you know left-handed pitchers, and yeah. I, I just felt like I was going to get a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Quayar, big slow curve, McNally. Well, here's the Palmer. other guy that we put into these uh, <laughs> put into these highlights. A fellow named McNally. But well, he'll never forget that. That's a grand slam home run. He'll never let runner. us forget You're that. Right. Come on. <laughs> I think that's the only time it's ever been done Everyone's in World correct. Series history. Never been done by a pitcher. He always said he could hit. <laughs> McNally. <laughs> hey, didn't he out hit George Brett in well, high school? That was McGregor. Oh, that was McGregor. McGregor. That's right. right. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> and just in case you want to see him, see you do it to Johnny Bench one more time. <laughs> there it is. Man, I guess. Uh, Whoever wrote the script for this series figured it out that uh, even though this is a very routine play that you might as well make the last out of that series as the Orioles win that one in five. It's a tremendous thrill not only for the team but for the whole city to be uh, a part of something like that. Absolutely. It's just, uh, and this is the Sea of Orange in 1983 in, in Cooperstown and what a absolutely magnificent weekend that was. The president of the Hall of Fame told me that we had really established a precedent that would be hard. It would be a tough act to follow. He said they've never had that much excitement in the entire history of Cooperstown. Yeah, I ran into that fellow, Chick Lang from Pimlico, yeah. buying out the gift shop, as I can that's recall. Right. Well, the <laughs> merchants, you know, the merchants thought they were all ready for this. Uh, that's my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law, yeah. 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 But uh, they weren't ready at all because in a day, a day's time, uh, the Baltimore people had bought everything they had in town, and the merchants were saying, "Can you believe this? Our biggest weekend, and we've got nothing to sell now." <laughs> well, it was. Uh, it was an incredible outpouring, and I know you appreciated it. Yes, I did, Jack. Uh, when you when you think of uh, twice as many people that are coming to this uh, Hall of Fame induction as ever as ever have been there before, it just uh, it overwhelmed me for about. Uh, I was glad when it was all over because. Uh, it was quite a weekend. It's an absolutely neat event if only five people watch it, yes. uh, but uh, just super. Gentlemen, thanks for helping us remember these, these 30 years and for sharing these memories on this double anniversary we have going. Brooks, I guess you're glass, glad to uh, start being Brooks Robinson third baseman instead of Brooks Robinson player rep. That's right, Jack. I'm awful happy it's all over and uh, we're getting started and things have been going pretty good. Well, every, every year this time, for the last two or three years, we've been talking about his age creeping up on Brooks Robinson. It shouldn't it look like it last year with 162 games. You got another 162 in the back? Well, uh, I'm going to play as many as I possibly can. I'd like to play them all, but I think I uh, talked with Earl even last year when he was managing, and he felt like if I missed a, a couple of games here and there, well, it'd be a lot better for me, and I think he might be right. So I'm going to have to sit out a couple, I think. That won't upset you too much, will it? No, I don't think so. I, if, I, feel, like, if I feel like it's going to help me, well, I'm all for it. Everybody's hitting was off last year, Brooks. Yours was off a little, but not as much as uh, some of the other guys who are looked upon as the hitters in this game. How'd you keep yours up as well as you did? Well, I don't, I don't have any uh, reason for the... I, I feel like I didn't hit as well as I could, Jack. I hit 253, and I feel like I'm capable of doing uh, a lot better than that, and I think the rest of the guys are too, so maybe we're going to have something to prove this year. Do you think the uh, change in the mound and a couple of little rules they're changing are going to maybe swing things back in the direction of the hitters a little? Well, I don't think it's going to swing uh, things that much. I do think, though, the mound, lowering the mound, uh, will help the hitters to uh, help them a little. I don't know how much, but I think it's going to help some. 
16 gold gloves, an MVP award, even a World Series to call his own. And now tomorrow, if all goes well, Brooks Robinson will be named to the Baseball Hall of Fame. When it happens, Brooks, for one, will be impressed. Getting in the Hall of Fame uh, is just something that I never even dreamed about. When I was 18, I thought, you know, I was pretty presumptuous, but I said, hey, I'm going to make it to the big leagues. But when you talk about getting in the Hall of Fame or being a leading candidate for the Hall of Fame, that's just beyond my wildest dreams. And uh, I haven't really, you know, uh, collected all my thoughts, I guess, what you could say, uh, about the Hall of Fame, but it is something that I just never dreamed about. We'll get the word at a noon news conference tomorrow in New York, and News Scene 2 will be there. The betting is Brooks and Juan Marichal will make it. Jack Dawson, News Scene 2. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Brooks Robinson, the greatest third baseman who ever played baseball, and uh, I'm really thrilled to see him go into the Hall of Fame. I really am. Well deserved. It's, uh, if he doesn't deserve it, who does? He's always been the all-time great. Oh, yeah, it always makes you feel good. Brooks is number one. We have the good news of the election of Brooks Robinson and Juan Marichal. Uh, I don't know of any more deserving men on the list. like Brooks Robinson even come to this city and uh, this is it you know with Brooks getting in it's you know everybody in Baltimore gets into the Hall of Fame that's the kind of guy he is and then I count another blessing one that players in today's game may never appreciate because of baseball's changing structure that is Baltimore I share this day today with my adopted hometown because the people of that town have supported Brooks Robinson not only on the good days, but also on the bad days. My career has been all the more meaningful because of the Oreo fans and friends many of whom have made this trip to join me here today. This is just not Brooks Robinson's induction into the Hall of Fame. It is a day on which men as fortunate as I am count their blessings, of which I have had so many. Thank you. I think that uh, I would like people to Remember Brooks Robinson uh, from a player standpoint as a player who loved the game. I can't ask any more. I, I got more out of the game than I ever thought I would uh, when I was 18 years old. I felt, uh, I guess I was being presumptuous, but I thought that, uh, you know, Brooks Robinson was going to make the, the big leagues. That's, that's the thing that uh, I felt like I could do, and uh, I was being pretty presumptuous, I guess. But then uh, I really felt like that I got the most out of my, out of my ability. And I love the game. So, uh, and I think that from uh, outside of baseball, and uh, uh, I guess I'd like people to remember me as someone who uh, really uh, who liked people, who uh, felt like that he could put something back into the community. Uh, I've taken a lot out of the community. So uh, that's really uh, the way I'd like to be remembered. And I, as a native of the old line state of Maryland, am very proud to present to you Brooks Robbins.
been. You have always been so good to me. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you.